Okay, so welcome everyone um, who's managed to find us via Craig's page. Apologies for that. To episode seventy-three, uh, Project Live episode seventy-three, uh, and we're we're delighted to be joined by the panel that you see in front of you, who will will get onto. Um, introducing a new course uh, but this is a bit of a special one because uh, you know a lot of our episodes are, are us chatting uh, academics perhaps chatting or people and, and this one is for, for really genuinely truly for everyone uh, you know uh, we've got a scenario here where given the current global situation there's uh, been a scaling back of a lot of services um, and there's a very real risk that that could result in an increase in lower limb amputations so um, when we were speaking to Martin, Martin Fox, who we well known to everyone uh, on the panel here as our vascular specialist podiatrist, um, it was really important that, that, that we got the message out there to everyone of, of what the big risks for immediate amputation are and, and how people get, everyone gets comfortable assessing these and triaging these. So we want people to leave this session with greater comfort, greater confidence in identifying, assessing, triaging. The, the big risk factors for amputation. The, the guys at Foot Diabetes uh, UK have, have generated a, a brilliant pathway, which you can probably see as Craig's green screen backdrop. Don't worry, we will be linking to that. We will be uh, zooming in on it um, as we go through the chat. Um, so in no particular order, let me introduce the panel and then I want to say thank you to all of them for their, for their time. Um, I've put my glasses on to feel more intelligent in, in this company. Unbeknownst to me, a couple of them are actually wearing pyjama bottoms, so I probably hadn't a bother. <laughs> but in, um, in, in no particular order, we've got Mike Edmonds, who is a consult, consultant physician. As we've already said, we've got Martin Fox, our vascular specialist podiatrist, who will be known to everyone. Uh, Paul Chadwick, uh, College of Podiatry Clinical Director. Um, Naz Nasir Ahmed, uh, consultant vascular surgeon, set the stage alight on our annual conference as well last time. I'm sure people <laughs> recognise him from there. And uh, Emma, Emma McCona McConaughey, I hope I haven't heard that, Emma. <laughs> Apologies if I have. Um, who is an incredibly experienced uh, private practitioner, well known to people as, as, a, as a College of Podiatry sort of representative and, and helps most of us with queries on, on the internet almost daily. Um, and she's gonna bring things together for us to at the end be our representative as all of us as private practitioners who myself very much included are perhaps less uh, familiar. We don't see the, the, the at risk for on a, more, on a more daily basis. So the two biggest risk factors for immediate amputation uh, severe infection and ischemia. We're going to sort of uh, take this episode forward with all of these specialists here sort of talking us through the pathway um, and they've, they've divvied it up into their, into their areas and I think we'll start off talking about infection if we may and we're going to have Paul and Mike uh, take us through infection um, and for anyone listening if you have any questions as you go along ping them into the comments um I'll, I'll scribble the one i'll scribble them down and we'll have a little panel panel q a at the end but paul and mike if you don't mind sort of kick, kicking us off uh talking us through uh infection and how we get comfortable and confident um sort of assessing and triaging yeah thanks ian for that i'm happy to pick that up in the first instance then i'll probably pack us over to mike for the severe infection um and let him describe sepsis for us um, so infection, one of make it clear, is a, is a clinical diagnosis. So we need to think about how we don't know that as a clinical. It's not based on swabs. Um, it's based on what you see in front of you. So we think about infection based on um, there's five cardinal signs of inflammation. So that's heat, redness, pain, swelling, and discharge. If you have two of those five, you can ex and they can exclude other causes of inflammation. So if obviously if someone's fell down and stubbed a toe or got a... Um, you know, hot or burn or some reason why they've got inflammation, then potentially that might be a cause for inflammation. So gout is another example or all these other causes of inflammation. But if they've got heat, redness, pain, swelling or discharge, two of those five in the presence of a wound, we should start making a clinical diagnosis. And what's really key about this, this clinical diagnosis is that we can put that into a severity and the, the, the background that you can see behind Craig there where we're talking about this severity status it's really key that we start as practitioners on the front line thinking about how we manage the lower ends of infection so the no infection the mild infection and some moderate infection depending on on our skills and capabilities so we think about what no infection is it's a wound that's got no heat no redness no pain no swelling and no discharge I'm going to say that many times hopefully through the next uh, few minutes so people take that message across and then what really the key one is these mild infections. So these mild infections are where there's um, redness, less than two centimeters of redness around the wound. 
or where the wound is superficial. In other words, it doesn't probe to bone, there's no tendon visible, it's a superficial wound. And that we would class as a, a mild infection that can really be managed and assessed um, in community and in the front face, in the, in the front line clinician, clinical space. We then move up to a moderate infection, and that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult and where that should be managed. It certainly needs some support from the MDT. It certainly needs some guidance from, a, from an MDT. But a moderate infection is where there's a deeper wound. So we've got a wound that maybe probes to bone or, or there's an abscess present or where there's more than, um, there's extending redness more than two centimeters. So we've got this differential there, then that's the really key differential in terms of mild to moderate and how we pick that up and how we manage that, which we can come back to later once we've discussed severe. I'll pass over to Mike now to talk you through what severe infection looks like and how that presents. Okay, thanks, thanks Paul. Uh, it's it's uh, very important in these days to identify infection that may be limb threatening or sepsis which may be life-threatening so what threatens the limb the limb can be threatened by an ulcer extending down to bone with infection tracking through the surrounding tissues and the limb may also be threatened by a rapidly spreading cellulitis indicated uh, with the classical signs as Paul has just described redness swelling heat onset pain and associated with discharge of pus but it's a rapidly uh, spreading cellulitis uh, and look for other signs such as say crepitus in the skin indicating gas in the tissues and, and look also for patches of black discoloration or wet gangrene you know, this is necrosis caused by infection and is limb threatening the whole issue here re with regarding severe infection is that you've got to ask the question does this patient need surgery need surgical drainage because that's the really the, the crucial point for making the diagnosis and getting the patient uh, into hospital also note that the presence of an infected ulcer in a critically ischemic limb can also be serious uh, and life-threatening so if you notice any of those in your practice and you feel that the limb is threatened then you've got to make an urgent referral according to your local protocol pathway and it's really got to be done that day you know, um, if, if there's a degree of ischemia to the vascular de department uh, you may be referring to uh, the, the medics or, or to the orthopods or to the podiatric surgeons but whatever your local protocol pathway is you've got to get that <coughs> in that day now let's go to sepsis an infected ulcer may be associated with sepsis which as we know can be life-threatening now how do you recognize that well again you've got to make it the diagnosis on a, a, cl a clinical grounds the patient may just look unwell. He's just not his usual or her usual self. Uh, may have flu-like symptoms, may be a little confused or drowsy uh, or unresponsive uh, in severe circumstances. You know, that makes you think there's something going on here, maybe sepsis. Uh, when you look at it, the patient, they may have a high pulse rate, over 90 beats per minute or they be, may be low below 50 uh, if you the the breathing rate the respiration rate uh, it, it can be over 20 breaths per minute anything over 20 breaths per minute is uh, a warning sign or it could be uh, below 11 uh, now there are two points to make at this stage I've talked about the symptoms and signs of sepsis but they may be diminished or absent in diabetes so you really got to be a good detective and if you pick up a, 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 a modicum of these signs you've got to think that this could be sepsis and the other point I want to stress is that these symptoms and signs of sepsis may be caused by COVID-19 itself so please be aware in these days that if you've got an ill patient you may have a foot problem but it may be 
COVID-19 itself. Whatever the cause of sepsis, you've got to get an immediate referral to the local hospital emergency department. I think that will be the protocol pathway uh, for most people. Uh, get to the ED emergency department and that department can then sort out, A, confirm whether this really is sepsis and B, uh, sort out the, the cause of this, whether it's uh, COVID or, or a foot problem. So the take home message from this part is you've got to diagnose infection and sepsis, severe infection promptly, and thereby in these days you can then save a, a life and a limb. So I, I think that, thank you. I think that's the, the initial things I would like to say about severe infection. Actually, can I, can I just ask a question, Mike? H have yeah. you seen any infections recently, in, I mean, diabetic foot infections in people with COVID-19? Yes. You have, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, well, actually, one, one patient came with a, a minor foot problem, but he just didn't seem himself. And you know, Craig, with this COVID, there's the classical uh, cough, there's the classical fever, but there's also the atypical signs. And, and some people just feel washed out. You know, they're, they're, they're mm -hmm. just not themselves. And we did the test and you know, it came back it came back positive so okay. i think you've got to have a a, a, a a wide sort of spectrum of diagnosis for this mm. condition perfect um anything else um paul that you need to say about infection before we ask um martin and naz to, to take us through some ischemic comments oh. No, I'm very happy with that. I think we've we've gone through the severity scale. We 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 just need to remember those five cardinal signs and symptoms of inflammation in the presence of a wound. Start to suspect infection. Really important that you categorise into that mild, moderate, or severe. That really drives your referral processes. So, yeah, I'm happy to really to pass over to uh, Naz and Mike and uh, Martin rather. Great. I've just had a quick question in actually, which I might fire back to you, Paul. Just while we're on the topic, it's not specifically to you but it's a comment about how the current sort of uh, impact of COVID-19 is making a lot of us work more virtually so you know through uh, digital online sort of consultations um, the sort of uh, I guess uh, assessing or triaging of these cardinal signs uh, completely viable over virtual consultations? Uh, yeah, I mean, in fact, um, um, Naz did a perfect example last week where he was seeing a patient um, in a, in a virtually with a podiatrist in in a, in a person's home and he was um, comparing the results of the of, of what the pictures were that the, the podiatrist was sending through on a what i think it was like a whatsapp type system if, NAS, if you can correct me if i'm wrong and really that that so the the as long as you've got reasonable pixelated cameras and most of the common um, smartphones have really good cameras these days you can pick up the cardinal signs and symptoms virtually um if you go to the american guidelines that which are on the links which we'll give out later they are they all feet on deck they're very much working very much towards consultations for these types of situations and they're, arguing, they're having the conversations about when somebody's actually been on antibiotics using virtual consultations to stop the antibiotics after maybe a mild infection so i think that the, the potential there for the using this virtual technology uh, much more and probably much more in the future as well after the covid's finished yeah yeah and, and add to that, that to, even today uh, a patient's wife took a, a picture of, of uh, her husband's foot and sent it into the clinic, you know, and that sort of set off the process of diagnosis of, of, of infection and the appropriate pathway. Great. Um, actually, Michael, I've just had a comment asking you if you could tilt your camera a tiny bit downwards because as yeah. beautiful as your eyes are, they're the only thing that some <laughs> people can see and they, and they, they can't see. Yep. That's that great, better? Mike. Yeah. <laughs> It just seems such a shame to waste, you know, most handsome man here, some would argue. Exactly. So it just seems, just seems a shame to waste it. Um, Mark, Ian. Has, Ian. Yeah, sorry. Well, could, yeah. could I just ask there on the theme of infection, because it's not an area for me working, I work comfortably with uh, chronic peripheral arterial disease and cardiovascular issues and smoking cessation, motivational interviewing. But infection is something that I don't tend to manage daily in my traditional role. But I'm going to be seeing a lot more of it, I think, as I work to support nurses and high-risk foot teams. Um, 
managing infection that isn't um, sepsis. Has Paul got any tips on how we, as clinicians who are not that au fait with, with um, pushing for antibiotics, could be um, getting a little bit more confident in that sort of mild to moderate management and making sure that GPs in particular were working with them in a timely way to, to get the most appropriate first line antibiotics. Have you got any, any thoughts on that, Paul, how, how we might get more yeah, comfortable I think, with that theme? I think it's, it's key that um, as a practitioner in an area, you find out your local antibiotic guideline. Um, antibiotic guidelines change from area to area depending on resistance patterns and different prescribing routes. So commonly what you <laughs> would be looking for would be um, in, a, in a new antibiotic naive patient would be... Um, something that's effective against gram positive cocci without getting too complicated but in each area the antibiotic of choice against that that um uh infection will be different so you need to go find that on your local hospital website um there is usually uh, an antibiotic guideline for all common infections not just foot infections but they will be there get used to them and then when you're speaking to your gp or your, your prescriber you can have confidence that you're choosing the right antibiotic say this is the patient they're presenting with this mild infection the first line in this area commonly would be fluoxacillin, for example and i think that's really getting to know your local guideline around antibiotic prescribing is is, is key i don't know if mike wants to add anything to that yeah i i know I, I agree I, one's got to be aware of uh, antibiotic stewardship but i i think anybody phoning up has got to uh, give over this, the issue that a patient may be in trouble with early infection and the sooner we treat that infection the greater the chance we have of preventing that person going into a severe infection and then needing a hospital admission and needing a precious bed so uh, while we we've, we've got to be aware of antibiotic stewardness i think you know we've got to be really sharp in treating the the, the early infection so that because the whole point of this is to save the hospital beds which are the premium at the moment so only the the the, the, the very few foot problems that really need uh, hospital admission get in and we save the rest of the beds for uh, our hospitals are now being turned into covid treatment centers basically you know hundreds of people hundreds of patients in <laughs> the hospital so I, I think i think people i think martin you were the, the, the gist of your question was uh you know how confident should people be in phoning up for uh antibiotics and and i think they should be really confident thank you i just want to uh just mention something uh that mike green uh, commented on and the reason i want to mention it is mike green may not know this he's the reason i'm a podiatrist um it's slightly off topic there um <laughs> but yeah he, he may not know that himself but he just said good guide for a uh, good guide for antibiotics download is the micro guide app you can download the guidance for your local trust and off the back of that a few people have mentioned in this current situation there's a reasonable good argument that the the independent prescribers uh, amongst us and the, the pomes kind of podiatrists um have a, a fairly strong role to play if you've got anything to add to that paul yeah it's, it's really key with um we've been looking at the sort of redeployment of ahps currently and one of the key things that stands out is the fact that podiatrists have access to many different medications through many different routes and you know, over independent prescribers supplementary prescribers uh, pom a pom s and uh, use pgds and when you look at the box ticking exercise in terms of who does what we're the one that stands out so we've got a real key role in this in terms of the, the access to medicines that we have that we probably underutilize as a profession but actually we could probably use a lot more particularly in this crisis yeah it, uh, From an time is Sorry. tissue yes, i think time is tissue and the earlier you get in with antibiotics with infection you know the, the quicker there'll be the resolution and there won't be any need for this, uh, you know, admission as such. Sorry, Emma, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say from an independent practice point of view, I have got POMS, but I only have a very small, limited amount of antibiotics in the clinic and my supply lines are drying up as well. So whereas my, my clinical team would normally be able to go to the cabinet and get antibiotics right now, we're going to have to go back to to look into contact our, our local GPs. So there might be a little bit of a change for, for some practice in that respect as well, purely because we can't get the supplies right now. 
Mm. Great. We'll just very briefly, although I'm sure we'll come back to just put opinions infection for now, and we'll we'll start talking ischemia if we may. So Martin and Naz, if you don't mind talking us through that side of the of the of the pathway, so to speak. Okay. If I come in first, Naz, is that okay with oh, you? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah. So um, just to sort of re-emphasize the point of this guidance from FUK, it's for all high-risk lower limbs uh, and people presenting with that. So not just people with diabetes, we're also looking at people with other long-term conditions who may have high-risk lower limbs, primarily because of vascular disease, but also things like connective tissue disorders, foot deformity, and neuropathy from a non-diabetes cause. So... Um, when you're looking at the lower limb, I, th I think certainly in my experience, podiatrists and nurses are a little bit um, nervous sometimes about making the call on uh, peripheral arterial disease or critical ischemia. And we really want to simplify here what we'd be hoping the clinician, any lower limb clinician will be doing. Um, and if they're checking out a lower limb with a new problem, primarily new pain or um, a wound that appears to be going the wrong way, that they can, in a structured way, just have a think about, is there any severe ischemia in that foot or leg? And if so, how are they determining that? And you might see our critical limb ischemia box there is just a few bullets. But if you use it sequentially um, as a clinician and you start by feeling for the foot pulses to see if they're um, easily palpable or not, and then if you've got your Doppler, having a quick listen with that to see whether they are dull monophasic or whether they're nice clear bi or triphasic pulses you're starting to build up the picture and then if you're suspecting severe ischemia because of the presenting pain in the foot which may be constant um, severe and unremitting for at least two weeks and isn't going away with usual pain management such as paracetamol use then that pain in the presence of non-palpable and uh, monophasic pulses or if you want to simplify it further weak and whooshy pulses um, is likely to be vascular related until proven otherwise unless of course there's a coexisting infection in which case it could be pain due to that so to sort of put that down into that simple quick check you, you palpated the pulses you had a quick listen um, you may have raised the foot up high to see whether it goes pale the burgers test and then if it does go pale within 30 seconds uh, the sort of deathly pale on the plantar surface and then you put the foot back down onto the floor it would usually go a sort of deep red uh, in, in response to the, the ischemia. So you've got that pale white up above, deep red down below, pulseless foot um, and monophasic but best on Doppler. You're already thinking this is probably critical ischemia. And then if you can take a simple basic systolic blood pressure, um, either using um, Doppler and, and SFIG um, on the ankle to see if that pressure is less than 50 mils of mercury, because less than 50 mils of mercury is always bad if it's higher than that it doesn't mean it's always good but less than 50 is always bad or if you've got the, the beautiful new toe pressure kits you can be putting that around the big toe putting your ppg sensor onto the toe end and taking a blood pressure of the toe and again if you're able to do that with one of your team or you've got the kit available to get a pressure less than 30 mils of mercury is again bad news for the foot um, and it's likely to be confirming that clinical diagnosis of critical ischemia. Now, critical ischemia is usually quite chronic. There are some big clues as to why it's there, um, usually in the history of the patient who's presented to you with a, a barrage of cardiovascular risk events or factors such as diabetes, hypertension, there may be some ischemic heart disease, hyperlipidemia, often a strong history of smoking, still too sadly, uh, maybe still smoking. Um, and it's sort of building that cardiovascular picture onto the clinical picture you've got in the limb there. So if you're, you've got those three or four signs of critical ischemia, you're then weighing up whether that limb has also got coexisting infection, in which case we've got a really bad situation, or whether it's a stable chronic critical ischemia. And maybe, even though ideally you'd refer that patient on to NAS, usually, it might be in this situation you're taking some telephone triage advice to manage the patient at home with the GP the district nurse and the podiatrist to control pain and try and keep wounds at bay. So as a first stab, that'd be my thoughts about how we might assess for and think about critical ischemia. And I suppose at this point, I'm really best handing over to Naz. <laughs> Cheers, Martin. Um, 
people are often scared of vascular um, and um, they don't sometimes people feel afraid of speaking to a vascular surgeon either a registrar or, or, or a vascular consultant often for very good reason because traditionally we're not very friendly and just want to try and reassure people that we are actually quite nice you know times are a changing <laughs> and we are actually quite nice nowadays um, and many vascular surgeons work really closely with podiatrists. I'm really lucky working with uh, with Paul and Martin over the last few years and all the guys in Salford and, and, and in Manchester. And they've really worked hard to upskill themselves and, um, and, and, and refer the patients to me at the right time. And what is absolutely crucial for me is that the patients are uh, assessed in the community and then referred to me um, as I say, at the right time. And Martin is absolutely right in that the way you um, diagnose a, uh, a, an ischemic limb is either on the history or on your examination. So from the history, it's about getting rest pain. And I only really ask one question uh, when it comes to rest pain. And that is, is to a patient, I'll say, do you have to hang your leg out of the bed at night? And if they have to do that, that is generally rest pain or they often sleep in a chair um, and it's and it's and it happens all the time every night it's not just now and again once or twice a week it's all the time there is a slight proviso with that in that with with diabetes they don't often patients don't often have the same sort of pain response you just need to be slightly careful about that so the first thing is in the history do they have that rest pain which is a pain all the time and then as martin said it's about uh, looking at the foot and having that index of suspicion and then it's about doing the systolic pressure on the toe now and, and as martin knows i'm a big fan of, of, of toe pressures um, and, and allied to that is the ankle pressure as well so once you've got those you've got the basic um you know the alarm bell should start ringing and there's a when i was a when i was a train when i was a, a young a young surgeon <laughs> just uh, not, not too long ago uh, one of my train one of my trainers said a lesson which i've never forgotten which is if it's not right it's wrong and if it's wrong it's your duty to make it right and the only thing you may have to do is pick up the phone and speak to a vascular surgeon and never ever be afraid of that you know, sometimes people think that oh, the vascular surgeon might think I'm a bit of an idiot. We always do, so don't worry about that, all right? So the, the key thing is pick up the phone and just speak to us and just be completely honest and say, listen, I'm not happy. I don't know. You're the experts. Can I bow down to your amazing knowledge and refer this patient to you? A bit of flattery helps enormously, and we love that kind of stuff. <laughs> so if you're scared of a vascular surgeon, just be nice to us. Just be deferential. And we will take your we will take your consultation without a shadow of a doubt. So the first thing is to is to get that right. And what we do from that is we will then make a decision as to what we do with that. Um, and there's two things we do. Uh, we then order a further investigation, either a duplex scan if the community podiatrists don't do that, or we then do some kind of uh, angiogram, either a CT, an MR, or a digital subtraction angiogram. And then we will treat in one of two ways, either with an angioplasty. Uh, and stent or with a bypass and just to pick up what Mike said uh, earlier on in this current COVID crisis um, what we are generally tending to do is treat patients endovascularly so either an angioplasty or a stent because that is a day case procedure done under a local anaesthetic and the patient will go in and out the same day a bypass we try to avoid in this day because that involves a general anaesthetic which takes up an anaesthetist, a ventilator and, the, and, and, and a prolonged hospital stay. And if a patient has got COVID and they have a bypass, the mortality rate is really quite high, up to 20% in, in some of the studies which are, uh, which are coming out now. So from the community point of view, as long as you've, you've assessed it and through your assessment, either from the history or from your investigations that you've done, either toe pressure or lipstick, and you're not happy, just pick up the phone. The key thing that, that I want to get across today is that vascular is still open. The hospital isn't closed. Vascular surgery isn't, isn't shut off to you. Speak to us. Our clinics and stuff are, and our routine stuff, it has been cancelled. But many of us now have daily hot clinics. And the community MDT foot cleans are still open. They're one of the precious services that are staying open. So if you are worried at all and it's not right, just phone us and we'll help you as much as we can. Now, um, 
we've also put into the box there, they, they're quite rare, but for us anyway, but it does occur acutely in ischemia. Okay. Could you just quickly run through that with, as, as, as regards to how it usually presents out of the blue? Yeah. Cool, yeah. So, uh, th so there's two types of, essentially two types of ischemia. There's acute limb ischemia and chronic limb ischemia. And as Martin said, chronic is basically, uh, it needs to be going on for, for at least two weeks before to, 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 to be given that title of, uh, of chronic. And that is a spectrum of disease. Acute limb ischemia is completely different. And what happens is you have a, essentially a normal limb. You often you have, you have the pulses which are palpable. And then something happens to suddenly stop the blood supply to that limb and what you'll generally find is that the foot goes cold it goes white um, you often then start to move uh, lose uh, movement and sensation and it's a sudden thing the patient can often time it to when it actually started and that is a vascular emergency and that patient needs to be seen the same day um, from a vascular point of view if you see that um, the way you can tell whether it's acute or chronic is essentially just examine the other limb. If on the other limb you've got a full set of pulses and it looks normal and the limb that's a problem has no pulses and it's something new and it looks white, that is acute limb ischemia and that needs to come to us straight away. Um, um, when you refer to us as a vascular surgeon, we only need to know two things about that, that acute limb ischemia and that is, uh, is there sensation? and is there movement. If you have sensation and movement, you've got time to try and save that leg. The first thing that tends to go is sensation. The leg becomes a bit numb. And then when it gets more severe, or it's been gone for a long time, uh, you start to lose movement. And these are signs that things are getting quite bad. So if you see an essentially a normal limb, and then it suddenly goes white, suddenly goes cold, particularly if you start to lose movement and sensation, that is an emergency and that, we, and that needs to come to us straight away. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, on, on the note of you being you know, vascular, being open, Naz, um, there was a comment um, by someone in London just asking if you've got any, uh, any recommendations for a good, good vascular surgeon there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's loads of good people down there it depends what you want um whether it's a lower limb stuff or whether it's um uh you know uh, some other thing i mean when i was training i went down to mike's unit and spoke with uh, hisham um and spent a day with uh, with hisham and he, he i learned how to do pedal bypasses from him so i would certainly recommend the the team uh down in kings which uh, which mike leads on um so that that for me is the is a go-to team for, for lower limb stuff uh, if you're further down south in Croydon, you've got uh, Stella, um, um, Stella Vig. Um, so those are the sort of the main names that, that, that I know down in London. Actually, Nassar, just um, right. the, the comment you made about vascular surgeons being quite approachable and that kind of stuff. We've actually had a comment here that's got a lot of thumbs up why, why you've been talking. And it's from Leanne, and, and I'm presuming she's a vascular nurse. And she said, "Oh, Leanne Atkins." <laughs> or, or, or she, she's actually said, "Or if you prefer to speak to a vascular nurse, we're always approachable." <laughs> <laughs> Leanne is fantastic, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> actually, Nat, when yeah. you're saying that you know vascular surgeons are very open and and um, happy to be phoned. Well, I said, it, I said it's changing and we're becoming more happy yeah. and more open. <laughs> well, you know, more happy, you know, personal, private, whichever one you want to go with. But uh, what about myself in independent practice? And, you know, same with Ian. Are we allowed to call you up? Oh, God, yeah. I've never felt that's the, the case yeah, no, in I, Central no, no, Scotland. If, but... if, yeah, no, no. if you are worried about a patient in the community and you think that this needs a vascular surgeon, just because you're in the private sector doesn't mean that, you know, you're excluded from that. The patient is still a patient and they still have access to the NHS. And if there is an emergency, that needs to go to the NHS and they need to come to us. So I, I, they should not be at all any hesitation just because you're in the private sector, you, you cannot refer to the NHS. Now, I would say absolutely, it's, you know, you are the patient's advocate and you need to speak to us if you are worried about that patient. If I can Excellent. just come in there again, Emma, um, it's a good mm -hmm. point you make. Um, that I think a lot of clinicians don't feel they can contact vascular teams directly now, not even for emergencies, because we're just not used to doing it. So many people would go through the GP as a port of access. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if, if clinicians feel they have to do that, that they must do that, 
with the degree of urgency from the pathway from the guidance that we've given there so that gp is not going to delay that call another day or another week particularly if it's an acute limb ischemia but of course one way around that is to is to ring the gp and inform them that you're going to contact the vascular team and just touch base with the gp first that and it, with these clinical criteria that you've seen in their patient are they happy for you to ring through to the registrar and in my experience, GPs are usually more than happy for a clinician who's on their game with a patient, know, knows that patient to some degree, um, to make that call on, on their behalf and, and, and move it on. But they do want to know sometimes where it's happened because it's their patient. So I think, yeah. Emma, it's, it's one of those things where you might be, uh, that first phone call, I remember my first phone call to a vascular surgeon. I was, I was, I was scared. Uh, I was nervous. I thought I was going to get told off. Um, but I structured it. I looked at the three or four things I wanted to say on the phone. I wrote them down first. I made the call to the registrar and it went amazingly well because I had a simple structure to the call and, and the registrar wanted to know certain things. And I could give them the, that information. So I think it's just having a go using the principles of the pathway for the first two or three times until you feel more comfortable with it. But certainly possibly involving the GP, at least retrospectively. So extra bonus point question for you both. What happens if it's a weekend? Because us in private practice, we work weekends sometimes. And my last critical limb, I will say I'm pretty much general. I don't often see um, a lot of the high risk stuff. My, my other colleagues do, but I don't. And um, it was a Saturday at 4.30 p.m. And I had a critical limb, pr limb presented uh, in a, a paraplegic, no less, <laughs> uh, which was fun. Yeah, I mean, so, but, so yeah, so the key, the key point, yeah, vascular is a twenty-four hour service, uh, and there is somebody on call. I, I do, we do whole weekends, so I'm I'm on for sixty hours uh, uh, straight uh, when I do a, when I do a weekend. God, that takes um, me back and, to the early days of private practice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, most vascular stuff, it's it's it, it's it's an emergency uh, uh, service. You know, there's very few things which are elective anymore, like you got carotids, aneurysms. Uh, lower limb stuff they're all quite urgent so it's quite it's quite an urgent uh, service um well just to pick on what pick up what what martin said um what does help enormously when you speak to uh vascular is to understand why are you calling us what what is the question that you have that you want us to answer and that question is either you want information or you want to get a second opinion or you want the patient admitted um, so as long as you get, you've got it clear in your head why you are calling us and you've got a coherent story that leads to that. I don't, I, 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 I think a lot of the reasons why vascular surgeons sometimes get upset is they can get referrals which aren't well thought through and there, there isn't really some thinking behind what the actual question is. But as, as, as Martin uh, demonstrated, you know, he went through what he wanted to say he got his diagnosis he, he he got an idea of what the question was and when you when you're presented with a structure in that way and you've got your examination findings uh, vascular surgeon we, we really like that I, I say the, the whole point of this pathway is to help people pick up limb threatening conditions so you're very well then justified if if, if you think that you have a limb threatening condition then you are totally justified in uh, in speaking either if it's infection it may be a different person but uh, uh, if it's ischemia to the vascular surgeon and w one advantage of 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 the centralization issue is that there is a vascular reg on call 24 7 in the hubs uh to take these calls so i i don't think anybody should feel uh intimidated uh, about making about making a call. Excellent. After all, it's just, only, yeah. surgeons are only human, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's easy well, to feel quite you, out of the loop you, you, when you don't you, work you, you say that, Mike. I'm not sure we are. I think we're slightly better than that sometimes, but that's just us. <laughs> I, know, I, I know you do. I know you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just just to emphasise the point that Martin has uh, have made and Mike's made. It's really key about the information you give when you when you're referring to a GP quote the guidance, quote the, the things that we're talking about in terms of the criteria that we're going to use to, to make these diagnoses. I think it's key if you, if you use a scheme, for example, whenever we're doing lectures on the foot and diabetes module or, or similar things, mem 
people still ask, what about hairs present? What about thickness of toenails? What about this? And I think it's key that we give the information that's on the guideline because that's what the vascular surgeons will make their decisions on. In the same way with infection, you know, you need to say that they've got two centimeters of redness. It probes to bone. There's, so these kinds of simple information that were within this pathway will help guide the referral and yeah. the, the access to medications and the appropriate vascular surgeon or, or diabetes consultant. Sure. I think you start off by saying, I've got a limb threatened situation in my clinic because of A, B, C, D, E. And I'd like you to take a look at him in the clinic. You know, I, I don't think anybody can refuse that. No. And it wouldn't matter if we don't have a sphygmomanometer in the, in the clinic, so we've not oh, been able to do no. the toe pressures. No, I, I mean, clinical, clinical ischemia really is a clinical diagnosis, isn't it? As, uh, as Nash and, and Martin has just said. You know, if the poor guy can't, you know, it, it can't sleep at night and he has to put his foot over the bed, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the diagnosis. Uh, and you, you just send them in. Uh, Leanne's popped a question up, actually, um, asking if we could briefly discuss when not to refer, because she feels this is just as important. Even in the COVID crisis, uh, she's getting referrals from clinicians due to absent pulses without rest pain or ulceration. It's a, it's a good point, Ian, and, and thank you for that, Leanne. Um, the the non-limb threatening problems box is, is perhaps the most large number of patients we will see out there in the community or in hospitals. And it's really important that um, the clinicians are seeing that as a separate set of clinical indicators that are important, but are not immediately limb threatening. I think, Paul, you were going to pick up on this and maybe just sort of skim through the themes there about when not to refer urgently to the... Yeah, well, if, if you do, when, after this uh, webinar, hopefully have a look at the, um, uh, the guideline in detail. But we talk about um, superficial leg ulcers that are, are showing signs of healing or evidence of healing. Um, so this, yeah, well, that's quite nice. Thanks, Clarig. Um, so, you know, we think about things where the, the ulcer size is reducing. So we have the classic one for DFU, where it's reduced by 50% within a four week period is a good indicator. So measure your wounds on a regular basis. If the wounds becoming shallower, there's less depth, if there's less exudate, all these kinds of things would indicate that the patient is potentially uh, wound is healing and that doesn't need to be referred on to a, a hospital service. Um, asymptomatic PAD or intermittent claudication only is another criteria. So a patient who is walking, um, complaining of claudication with some absent foot pulses, they don't need to be referring at this particular moment in time. You need to think about assessing them effectively, getting them on best medical therapy. I'm sure Martin will pick me up on anything that I miss in this, but smoking cessation, exercise therapy, if they um, have hypertension, then we need to manage their uh, blood pressure. Um, if they've got high cholesterol, then we'd need to manage, uh, you think about statins. And then there's issues about antiplatelets and when they should be added in as well. And then we look at, um, again, similar things like mild or leg inf mild foot or leg infections, which is how we started the, the conversation in, in the evening. In terms of these wounds that are superficial, that have got less than two centimetres of redness, which have got uh, no depth to them, the patient's systemically well, there's no evidence of sepsis, that we can manage these effectively in the community with the support of our high-risk teams if we need to, or we can have conversations with the MDT, but equally it's, it's key that we, we manage these patients as much as possible away from the hospital setting in these day in this in these days and this day and age and crucially the one thing we haven't touched on yet is acute charcoal and i think um and this is a really a, a neuropathy condition that we most so, um, associate most commonly with diabetes but it's related to neuropathy and we need to think about when we see these active charcoals when it's hot and red and swollen when there's no wound present when you can exclude infection and if you suspect a charcoal we should be offloading these patients um urgently and and again we, we have to think differently in in in, in today's environment that potentially casting um is it potentially might not be the, the, ob, the obvious solution might not need to look at other methods of offloading such as a, a boot or a crow walker as we're having difficulties with uh, aerosol generating from the cast source for example so but the key message is that we need to be offloading these acute charcoals as they're picked up whether that's in community or in the hospital so the hot red swollen foot with non-wounds, where with the neuropathic foot, we needed to start thinking about charcoal. And I'm sure Mike would like to come in on the charcoal management as it's another um, passion of his. No, well, I, I agree with you, Paul. I, I think there's perhaps a, uh, the pendulum swinging to the uh, removable cast rather than the uh, total contact, uh, non-removable cast. Uh, simply 
so that we don't have to ask the patient to come up to the clinic relatively uh, frequently for removal of that cast. Uh, it may not be ideal, but uh, I, I think a removable cast is, is preferable in these situations uh, and uh, it, it can avoid uh, the patient coming up and, and being treated for, for almost the whole duration uh, in the community uh, with perhaps a surveillance by, uh, say, a virtual communication, either with the patient themselves directly or, or, or with the community. Uh, so I, I think that's perhaps the one uh, slight uh, change of emphasis in these, uh, in these COVID times. Um, one thing, Mike, that I've, I sort of read this week on Twitter from a, a clinician who sees quite a bit of wounds and charcoal was that um, because of the enforced um, lockdown, many people are actually naturally more offloading their, their feet. And to some degree, wounds are healing um, and charcoal is possibly being stabilised by people just being basically confined, confined to barracks for a few weeks. And that, that may be one small positive in this picture. No, ab absolutely, Martin. Uh, um, uh, yeah, we're seeing that, and uh, I think uh, Alberto Piagesi, um, in his uh, um, lecture with Defoot, also has noticed that. So, so I, certainly uh, that those two conditions. So the the, the ulcer, the uncomplex, complicated ulcer, will respond, I think, to the less activity, uh, as will as will the charco. Uh, just to, to follow up Paul's point. I think there isn't it, there's this gray area of the moderate infection where you can sort of have see the patient quite frequently in the foot clinic uh, and do you know quite a bit of debridement. Uh, you may not sort of get it all done the first time, but at least to save the save an admission. Uh, and if you can back that up with community antibiotics, you can you can save quite a lot of admissions and it's really only the, the you know the horrendous infection uh, which you know needs drainage that night which uh, will we'll need to go into the hospital so I, I think the the, uh, the the foot clinic can take on quite a lot of these moderate infections. I think in reality Mike there'll be a lot of district nurse community nurse um, tissue viability, leg ulcer nurse um, teams that are working with podiatry services over the coming weeks a bit more closely. And they will be bearing the brunt of a lot of the chronic lower limb wounds uh, yeah. and the management of that. And again, there may be some good partnerships forming there where having to work together means that the management of such low, chronic lower limb wounds um, may be getting the benefits of both skill sets. So again, we might see some positives come from this in the management of wound and infection that's mild to moderate. Yeah, uh, and the MDFT say setting up once a week uh, uh, the uh, facility for a virtual clinic or a virtual discussion so that uh, th th these healthcare professionals, if, if they just want some uh, um, encouragement and, uh, and, and, and confidence, they can take a photo and discuss that uh, with the, the MDFT. Uh, say say once weekly. So so I think that is also a support for the community nurses and podiatrists. Yeah, I mean just to just to uh, follow on from that, uh, Mike. Uh, in in our local clinic, we've started a uh, high risk foot WhatsApp group, uh, and on yeah. WhatsApp you can have a uh, you know four people on at the same time in in a live video call. So what we've done is do virtual consultations just through that. Um, and in these sort of current uh, circumstances, the uh, we've been given the the go ahead to do stuff like that, it's something we, which we wanted to do for a long time, but yeah. we've just gone ahead and done it. And you can get, uh, I mean, I've spoken to patients, reviewed wounds, spoken to the podiatrist and the nurses in the patient's home, and given advice, and as well as having all the other specialists there as well. So it's 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 a real opportunity to uh, to, to try new things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we have the we have the same. Uh, no, so we we have a it's, I think it's a pando a pando clinic yeah. as, as well. And also, I, I think it's actually showing, um, in a paradoxical way, that some people in the community, some district nurses, uh, or 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 podiatrists, um, are they're not struggling, but they, they they want they want some advice, and they've 
in the previous past have found it difficult to get that advice uh, because it's one channel or this channel. But now with this sort of uh, telemedicine almost being forced upon us, I, I think uh, these uh, people in community who are really very uh, compassionate and want to do the best for their patients can actually get uh, advice, uh, di more direct advice than they could previously. Mike, just just one point. We're getting a wonderful view of your forehead again. Okay, is that better? Oh, that's better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a very uh, lovely forehead. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, Craig, could we? We've had a few people asking. I know we're going to post the link to it afterwards, but could we um, just do a full screen of the pathway and perhaps oh, get? Yeah. Uh, while we've got the panel here, get them to give us a bit of a real time talk. I, I got the impression when I, when Martin first sent me this, that this was uh, aimed at being printed off, laminated, putting up somewhere for, for immediate sort of reference. Um, could you guys uh, talk us through the the goal of using this? I see at the bottom as well, it looks like there's a little area there where you can put in Nazi's mobile phone number if you need to and things like that. Um, uh, essentially, what, what's the, the advice on how people will use this pathway um if i come in there i think basically the idea was it's it's a bit of an aid memoir for um use when you when you're a bit worried you've got that gut feeling there's something wrong in the foot or leg and that you've got this to hand so it would walk you through from the top to the bottom um through your scenario that you're seeing um and it, you might be any clinician any lower limb clinician it's not particularly focused on podiatrists so they will be a big user but any lower limb clinician with that new onset severe foot pain or leg ulcer in any clinical setting and the idea is it will tag into your local covid19 protocols so whatever your screening assessment is prior to seeing patients or bringing them up you would still use that and then you would start to think about the two key things that are going to cause limb threat so immediately want you to think there are many things you might see in the lower limb that are concerning you in your caseload but are you seeing limb threatening infection or sepsis and are you seeing critical limb ischemia and that's why we focused entirely on those two themes because they're the most likely things separately or together that are going to lead you or your patient towards a, a terrible disaster if not managed quickly and then as you go down the pathway it's just really about um managing that scenario down the left hand side with the uh, non-limb threatening box it, you then monitor the treatment for that patient locally with gp nurse podiatrist but if of course it takes a turn for the worse because you can have somebody who's got a stable ischemia for example or a stable wound and then week three week four it goes downhill and goes into that sepsis picture or that critical ischemia picture so it allows you to sort of over time review the patient with those two big red uh, flags firmly in your mind particularly if you're not that confident with them and the bottom bit there of the box is, is literally for local use so depending on your local availability you may have an integrated high-risk foot podiatry service or nursing service you may have a vascular service that's very accessible or remotely accessible a diabetes foot team an infectious diseases team which may be doing home, antibi home antibiotics iv um, or available via the hospital for advice and of course your orthopedic and podiatric surgeons may be playing a big part in your high risk low limb picture or not so much so it's really about you personalizing that pathway to your local environment what's in the 50 square miles around you and if you don't know find out now before you need to use them that'd be my take on it great um emma can i bring you in as our yes as our representative of all independent private practitioners uh, watching live and, and after the fact, um, anything you wanted to ask these guys about the sort of logistical, pragmatic sort of application of this or any, any, anything you want to be the voice of, of, as you so often are brilliantly on, on the internet, you want to be the voice of the public here while we've got these, uh, these guys in front of us. Well, I have to say, I have actually got my print out and uh, <laughs> it's version 1.3. So uh, if anybody has got one that isn't 1.3, make sure you go and get the latest one. Uh, Martin's been great at sharing that in all the groups and on Twitter and Facebook and everything as well. Um, first of all, can I just say thank you very much to all of you for doing this. For and I'm going to use a great Scottish word, a numpty like me. So see, I don't often uh, see a lot of vascular stuff in, in clinic, um, but because of changing ways, I might be the emergency person on for the urgent care in my clinic that day. So it's great to have this to refer back to, to, to break it down nice and simply for me. Um, I 
think I've probably asked most of the questions I already had. I've got my little notepad here that I've been writing down things as we went. Not Nazi's phone number, because, you know, I'm married and we might have to get that one <laughs> offline. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've had all my little questions uh, going here. But I, for, for me personally, I think you've all done a really lovely job of making this nice and simple. Um, and, yeah, I feel a bit more confident now if somebody comes into my clinic with presenting about this. I, I know what I'm supposed to do. The, the takeaway for me is going to be how do I find out these phone numbers? Now, I've already had my little tendrils out um, and I happen to know somebody that works in my local NHS and I private messaged them and asked, look, what are you guys doing? Can I get a phone number? And very kindly, they did respond with one. But it'll now be a little bit of fact finding for me to find the contact points for, for my area and how I can take it from there so that we're ready and hopefully not have to use them, but ready if we are. Perfect. Great. Uh, Craig, anything else that uh, my, my been, screen down here is frozen? Yeah, been Any a, other questions? No, there's been a lot of comments and, and, and um, I won't raise any, but I, I, there is one, one question. I'm quite curious about this one myself and it's more for Mike and Nasir, but um, there was something, this is from George, he said there was a comment in the media that uh, COVID um, can lead to an acute ischemia on its own. Is that, has that been reported or...? Yeah, I've been asked this question three yeah. times, Mike. I think this might be one for Mike because it's, 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 you need somebody intelligent to answer that question. Yeah, <laughs> there, there's, there's been some recent report, a recent report that uh, the infection uh, was uh, associated with uh, endothelial damage and uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. So there were, I think there were three cases where there was evidence of infarcts uh, in the brain and also uh, of ischemia in the leg. So um, I, I, th I think we're only just trying to understand this infection, you know. Originally, it seemed to be, oh, it's a bad chest infection uh, with a bit of flu. But it, it's, a, it's an horrendous infection. Uh, you're getting, uh, uh, and on top of that, you get, I think, a, a lot of clotting. Uh, the FDPs are up. Uh, and they're now considering anticoagulating these people right from the beginning because they, 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 they may clot uh, in the arterial pathways. And, and, and just to add to that, uh, there's been some reports in the Italian literature of these uh, bluish purple uh, areas in the fingers and in the toes and on the plantar surfaces in young people who get this COVID infection. It's in the Italian literature. I think it's a small vessel uh, occlusion uh, related to the infection. So uh, I think be, be aware that, that, that this, this condition can cause uh, much more than a, 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 a respiratory problem uh, as well. And I, I mean, the other clue, if you're screening people, is this muscle aching that people get. Uh, people say that the, the, the muscle enzymes are, are up in the sky sometimes uh, with, with these conditions. So it, it, I think it can cause lots of uh, different problems to different systems. Great. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Right. Good. I think we're just on the hour, so it's probably a good time to wind up. But there's been one question that got asked really early on, and I've decided to hold it to the end. And it was, it was for you, Martin. And I, I apologise, I can't remember who asked it, but they wanted to know how were you able to get a haircut in the lockdown? <laughs> <laughs> well, my um, 16 year old daughter, who's marvellous at doing um, Game of Thrones female hairdos, <laughs> has managed to learn on me how to do a short back and side. So I'm, uh, I'm really quite pleased with the effect of that, actually. Yeah. But at some she... point, Naz, I do promise you I'll be joining you. This will come off when it needs to. But no. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with what's happening here in Australia, but uh, hairdressers have been deemed as essential workers, so they're still open here in Australia. <laughs> every, 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 um, I, I suspect that's more to do with the fact that there's 40,000 people unemployed if they do close them down, but it's, it's, they haven't actually been directed to close yet. <laughs> Look, thanks very much, everyone. Look, it's gone gone really quickly. We, we're approaching the hour. Um, so, you know, again, thanks, everyone. For those who've joined late, um, we did have a few technical issues. Hopefully, the video will be back on YouTube. But the video will be on YouTube in a couple of hours. It will be rendered on Facebook. We might just have to link to it a bit differently than usual. So oh. thanks so much, everyone. It's been really good. Thanks, guys. Okay, bye.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, here's back.